Oh, hi there. Today we're going to talk about meditation. And by the way, this is not how I do it. We're going to talk about meditative states for people who have trouble meditating the old-fashioned way. So stay tuned. Hi, Dr. Carmen McGinnis here. Welcome to my channel. On this channel, we talk about relationships of all sorts, including what I call the primary relationship, which is the relationship that we have with ourselves. I am a board-certified behavior analyst with, uh, with a doctorate in behavior analysis and a master's degree in health psychology. I also own and operate a school for children with disabilities and a psychology center where I have a regular client base that I see both on site and through a HIPAA secure web platform. So welcome and today we are going to talk about meditative states for people who have difficulties meditating including myself. And thank you for putting up with my cute little intro. I sometimes do sit like that just for fun for a moment or two but that is not in fact how I meditate. And we're going to talk about that quite a lot today so that, um, so that you too can spend lots of time meditating. I think that, that this um, topic is an important one not only for people who actually have trouble meditating the old-fashioned way, as you saw me in the little cutesy intro, but also people who don't have a lot of time to meditate or who just find that they don't meditate as much as maybe they should or would like to or that they feel would be beneficial. And of course we always have periods in our lives when meditating the good old-fashioned way is not terribly convenient. So today we are going to talk about meditative states for people who don't meditate. And hopefully this will be helpful for you. So to get started the benefits of meditation are huge, megalithic, and highly publicized as well. According to the CDC, Center for Disease Control, the numbers jumped from about 8% in 2012 to 14% in 2017. The CDC has not yet released numbers for 2019, but studies that I accessed online report 19% as of January 2019. And as of today, I was able to pull up 61 meditation retreats right here in the U.S. That does not include the rest of the English-speaking world and the rest of the world at large. Obviously, different countries might have uh, higher or lower meditative practices. But when we think in terms of the Western world and English-speaking countries, and the U.S. in particular, we are talking 61 meditation retreats that I just pulled up online and was able to count. That's a lot, and I suspect there are many, many more that haven't come up on Internet searches yet. So according to the studies that I reviewed today, the main reason for the increase across the last several years is a desire for improved mental and physical health. And there's no doubt the effects of meditation are well established for both of those areas. Reduction of chronic pain, lowered blood pressure and heart rate, cessation of smoking, drug or alcohol abuse, decreased anxiety, and improved sense of well-being, which is basically the medical word, medical term, for the opposite of depression. These are all among the effects of a regular meditation practice. In Buddhism, meditation is considered a time of deep connection to the divine. A time when we humans tap into the river of the universe, what Buddhists call nirvana. 
Many of us, Buddhists and non-Buddhists, believe that meditation increases intuition and access to universal or collective wisdom. In a decade, this is my story personally, in a decade long, long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I tried to meditate. Not because I was depressed or needed to quit smoking or suffered from any kind of physical malady, but simply because I was a Buddhist. I had recently become a Buddhist in 1985-ish, and meditation is kind of expected of Buddhists. So there I was, a newbie, just kind of trying to fit in and very much wanting to meditate. It was 1985, and I was among 15 or so professionals who sponsored a Burmese monk to, re to remain in southwest Florida after he finished his doctoral studies at the University of Ohio. And that's where I lived at the time, in southwest Florida, and a bunch of us really just wanted him to stay there. He had made his way there on a, on a, a talk tour that he was doing, and, and we persuaded him to stay if we could fund his remaining there and teach us how to meditate and teach us about Buddhist practice and possibly establish a monastery. So his name was Wimala, and as I said, he was a doctoral graduate of the University of Ohio. And as a monk with a doctorate in linguistics, it was among his jobs to translate ancient Buddhist texts. While he was with us, he would also make weekly visits to my private school. It was a Montessori school, uh, kindergarten through eighth grade, which was about five miles away from the home that we had established for him. And there at the school, he would beg alms from the students who would bring items from home for him every Tuesday. And then he would teach them about the world religions because he knew quite a lot about all of the religions and he would teach them how to meditate. It was a magical time in my life, personally, about four years in all, that he was there with us. And I learned so much about Buddhism during that time. And of course, I desperately wanted to learn to meditate. But in the end, I couldn't do it. What happened when I tried? Well, I would start off great. I would be okay, I would be relaxed. I would be breathing nicely. Uh, back then I could get easily get into the pose that you just saw. Um, and then suddenly, a few minutes in, I would get a spinning sensation. It was as if, with my eyes closed, as if my whole, every I was spinning within the world or the world was spinning around me. And this would set in hard. And not surprisingly, it was followed by dizziness and then, of course, nausea, because that's what happens. When you're, when you're spinning, you get dizzy. When you're dizzy, you might get nauseous. And when I would get up after trying to meditate, I'd have vertigo for anywhere from a few minutes to up to an hour. Needless to say, I was extremely bummed out. But with encouragement from Wimala, I got through it, and I will explain how in a few minutes. So other people who've had these sorts of troubles trying to meditate have also reported numbness, uh, a sense of fear, increased anxiety, and even panic. It turns out about 15% of those who would like to meditate experience one or more of these sensations. And the causes have been linked to poor circulation, either as a condition or as a result of uh, the posture that you take when in traditional meditation. Hyperventilation is another thing that's been pointed to. And cognitive functions as well, such as fear of the abyss of nirvana itself. Nirvana, both nothingness and everything, can be a frightening concept. The release of a sense of self is huge. Letting go of the ego. No, le no ego. Um, no self. And it tends to open doors to the subconscious when we approach this state. And that's a place that not everyone wants to go. Now, before I go into how to achieve a meditative state without actually meditating, I want to make a disclaimer here. All of the above challenges 
can probably be corrected with proper instruction from a trained individual of one sort or another. For example, if proper yogic breath is the problem, working with a heart math uh, provider such as myself might help. And of course, a yoga, a yoga teacher or meditation coach can train you in breathing as well. And in posture, if circulation is the problem. And of course, a strong disclaimer here is that you do want to make sure that you don't have a medical condition that's causing these problems. I am not a medical doctor. I am a, a, a doctor of behavior analysis. So I think it's important that you get checked out if the, if the condition, if the um, response continues. If you have a fear of the abyss of nirvana itself, you might want to work directly with a monk or some other spiritual guide of some sort or explore the psychological reasons with a mental health counselor uh, who's also versed in meditative practices. Bottom line, for most people, these challenges can be overcome. Or you could try, instead, achieving a meditative state, accessing the benefits of meditation without actually meditating, which is what the rest of my talk is about. And it's what I do. The first thing that Wima La suggested for me back then in 1985-86 was to take long walks, and I mean long walks. Walks that have no particular goal or end, no destination. Obviously, you're gonna end up back where you started, but you're not going anywhere in particular. Walking is an interesting process. It's, it involves three things that I think contribute to its meditative qualities. One is repetitive body movements. You're walking, your feet are going up and down, treading forward, your hands are swinging a little bit. Time to let thoughts buzz in and out is a second thing that I think it has in common with meditation. And a particular kind of visual input. And the, these three, to clarify, these are three things that I think contribute to a meditative state. They don't necessarily look like traditional meditation, but they contribute. So the last one is a particular kind of visual input. Some of you might be familiar with a therapeutic uh, technique called EMDR. It's a visual protocol for use with trauma patients, and I am not trained in EMDR, but I am well read in it um, as a mental health provider. I'm aware of it, <clears throat> and I understand. I've read the books. The method helps reprocess negative memories stored in the body, usually during some kind of uh, traumatic event. The innovator of EMDR, Francine Shapiro, Dr. Francine Shapiro, actually had the first inspiration during a walk. She writes about this in her books. When she noticed the effect of visual stimuli moving past and away from her in her peripheral vision, as she walked. And this became the basis of the method that she would later term eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR. As a psychotherapeutic approach, the method is, of course, paired with counseling of some sort. But if your goal is meditation alone, rather than counseling, walking can produce a kind of mental and physical reset similar to the effects of EMDR. So there's one thing to try, a long walk. Now, before I go into the other ideas uh, that I have for you today, I want to preface all of this to say that any sort of meditative practice should include an intention. So if it's a long walk, start it with some sort of verbally stated intention. It can be as simple as asking the universe or God or Mother Nature, whatever you believe in, even asking yourself to allow for the release from worries, burdens, or whatever you need to be released from at that moment. For me, I might start my walk with something like this. 
Universe, through this walk, please grant me the serenity from the burdens of my day and grant me the strength to continue to serve myself and those I watch over. So always start with some sort of an intention. And we'll talk more about this toward the end of, of my presentation today. In addition to a walk, you might try a bike ride also repetitive motion, and also visual stimuli speeding by, even faster. Other things that have worked for me to achieve a meditative state, meditative state involve using my hands in one way or another. I don't knit. I wish I did. I don't crochet. Um, my mother did, but I never got taught somehow. But if you do, those might work really well for you. Rug hooking is similar, a similar thing to try, and it's something that uh, I've done from time to time over my life. It's funny, I never do anything with these little squares that I hook, but it's quite relaxing. I used it when my wrist was broken and I was trying to regain flexibility. I used it as one of those things to help with that. Art is, of course, wonderful if you're in any way talented or not. For those who aren't particularly artful, try coloring, coloring books. There are hundreds of adult coloring books on the market these days for this very purpose. Remember to set your intention first, and remember not to rush. It may take a while to reach the meditative state that you desire. You'll know it happened when time seems to stop and you realize there were no thoughts in your mind, even if it's just for a while. Another thing to try is gardening. Weeding is particularly repetitive and mindful. In fact, if you want to come over here and weed, you're more than welcome to. Stargazing and cloud spotting are two other pursuits that have led me to a meditative state without even realizing that it would, would happen. Again, remember to set your intention first. So let's talk a little bit more about that intention, what it is and what it is not, and how to pull a mantra from it. And what is a mantra? A mantra is a pithy word or phrase to help you maintain your meditative state when thoughts and other words sneak in. So you're going to create your intention. Your intention is stated to whoever you believe in even if it's just yourself. So it might be something like self or your name, Carmen. As I ride my bicycle, allow the thoughts of the day to clear from my mind and a sense of calm to set in. That might be one. In this case, my mantra would be, I am calm. So on my bike ride, I state my intention first, and on my bike ride, I go off with the intention, and as thoughts come into my mind and disturb my sense of calm, I'm going to state my mantra. I am calm. So there's an example of that for you. So you state your intention as you set off, and then you repeat the mantra whenever life starts to sneak up on you and the noise starts to come into your purview. Be careful not to make your intention a demand. That's one of the things it's not. Ask nicely. Don't try to dictate your needs and desires to the universe or even to yourself. The universe knows what's best for you. Your higher self knows what's best for you. And like a loving parent doesn't want you to whine or fuss or demand. Another activity that can bring about a meditative state is driving. Again, the visual stimuli speeding by can help. And the sort of autopilot quality of driving is also something that happens in meditative states. You might ask if this is safe. And another disclaimer here, do not try this if you don't feel safe. However, alpha and theta waves are what we seek during meditative states and there's actually that's actually what happens when experienced drivers those of us who can go into auto, autopilot drive so it's happening anyway 
if you set the intention first and stick to the mantra and think of it as a meditative state while you drive, again, don't try this if you don't feel safe, then you can accomplish your meditative state. Similarly, during a walk in nature, we tend toward alpha waves as well. And pursuits like knitting and coloring might result in gentle swings between alpha and theta waves. Just point of in information, alpha is 8 to 12 hertz and theta is 3 to 8 hertz. And they tend to be deeper. So they're shorter but deeper. And the last thing to try to reach a meditative state, the last advice I have for you today, I'm sure there are other ways as well, I would appreciate it if you post them, if you think of them, post them in the comments below. But the last thing I have for you today is sleep. Now this might seem a little bit like cheating, but in fact sleep is not um, cheating. It's not dissimilar to meditation at all. So when you state your intention first, sleep can be magical. Falling asleep takes you from beta to alpha to theta to delta eventually. So that time spent in alpha and theta can be thought of as a nice little meditative break, even if it's just a nap. Again, remember to state your intention first. And there's some ideas for you. There you go. And one fi final bit of advice is to keep a journal nearby. Always keep a journal nearby. Whatever comes with you out of your meditative state, even if it's just a word or a phrase or an image, should be noted. And it might have meaning later. You never know, even if, even if it's not meaningful now. Like the intention, don't force it. Don't force that meaning to come out of your meditative time. So I sincerely hope this has been helpful. And I hope that many of you will comment below so that we can share a little bit. And I look forward to seeing you soon um, for my, this coming Wednesday, for my midweek sneak peek. Keep in mind that there is a hurricane offshore nearby me that way. Uh, Hurricane Dorian is spinning around out there as this is recorded. I don't know when you're going to watch this. But those of you who are watching it soon, be aware that uh, Wednesday I may not have electric. I'm very much hoping that I do, but I may have lost internet or electric and not be able to post a midweek sneak peek. I will give it my best shot. Until then, have a wonderful week, and I will see you soon. Take care.